my story began when I was 13, and it began when a close family friend, who was like an uncle to me, actually passed away from pancreatic cancer. And when the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer. And what I had found really shocked me. You see, over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. Why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique, I mean, that's older than my dad. But also, it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. Learning this, I was sure there had to be a better way. So armed with ninth grade biology, I decided to set out to change cancer diagnostics. Bit lofty of a goal, however, I was going to run with it. And then I went back online, I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like in order to effectively diagnose the disease. The sensor would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And you see, there's a reason why we haven't updated a Center for Pancreatic Cancer in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for the cancer, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these changes in levels of proteins that are found in there. And while this sounds really straightforward and easy, it's anything but. You see, you have liters and liters of blood in your body, and that's already abundant in protein. And so when you're looking for this tiny increase in this tiny amount of protein, it's next to impossible. It's like trying to find a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred due to my teenage optimism, or how some people label it, complete ignorance of the entire field, I went to any teenager's best source for information. Google, Wikipedia, how I get through every high school test and quiz. And essentially, I found a database of over 8 thousand proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these different cancers. And I decide, well, it's summer break, I really have nothing else to do. So I shut myself in my room and decided to bash out all 8,000 of them. And by the end of the summer, I was beginning to lose my mind. I was really doubting my potential for any social interaction in the future. And it made for some really, introduction, like, really interesting introduction essays, like back to school. Like, what did you do this summer, Johnny? Oh, I went to Yellowstone Park. What did you do, Jack? Oh, I locked myself in my room and looked at proteins. So, however, on the 4,000th try, I finally found one protein that's found and could potentially detect pancreatic cancer. And the name of this protein is called mesotheon. And it's your ordinary, run-of-the-mill type protein unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But the key is, is that it's found the earliest stages of the disease, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So by detecting this protein and the changes in its levels, we could potentially detect the presence of pancreatic cancer before someone actually has developed the cancer. And then I realized I'm going to need to actually like, figure out how to detect the protein. This is like the problem at hand. And it finally came to, like I finally had this epiphany moment in this journey that I was going on. It happened in a very unlikely place. High school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation, particularly with my high school biology teacher. I mean, it was me versus her, like, constantly throughout the year. I did not like that teacher at all. So one day, it had escalated to the point of me blatantly ignoring her instruction, and I decided to get back at her. I'd bring some real science into the classroom. So I snuck in an article in what I called carbon nanotubes, long, thin pipes of carbon that are a single atom thick, and they're 150,000th the diameter of your hair, so extremely small and they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. So I felt real suave, reading under my desk, kind of like a comic book, but science. 
And we are learning about these things called antibodies, which are essentially molecules that only react with one specific protein. In this case, that cancer biomarker. So I was just sitting in class, reading this article, and all of a sudden it hit me. What if we could combine these two principles? You see, you can take these antibodies and weave it into this network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. But also, the coolest thing is, is due to the properties of these nanotubes, it will actually change how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present, and thus tell me whether or not you have pancreatic cancer. And I can measure this with a $50 ohm meter I got from my dad while I snatched it from his garage. And essentially, just as soon as I had this epiphany moment, my biology teacher, I swear she has eyes on the back of her head. She whirls around, red in the face. She's like, Mr. Andrako, what are you doing? She storms up, steals it. It's like, what is this real science doing in my classroom? And I admit, I, after 30 minutes of like, really sucking up to her, I finally got that article back. I really didn't care about anything she was saying about like, self-respect and respecting your teacher. However, eventually I could actually start doing some research. And I realized these carbon nanotube networks, they're really flimsy. And since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper. And making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. I mean, when like, I get a B on the test, watch out. The chocolate chip cookies are going to get eradicated. Plus, some ice cream is going to go missing with them. However, you start with some water. You pour in some nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. And then all of a sudden I realized, I'm going to need a lab for this, right? I mean, I can't have like the Andreka household kitchen like cancer research program. My mom wasn't going to really have that in the budget. I mean, we had done some pretty crazy stuff. We have some of the uranium in our basement, like some nitroglycerin, and we're even on the FBI watch list. However, cancer research wasn't in the future. So I decide I could just apply to a lab, right? So I decide, um, let's write up this big lab procedure. I typed it up, 32 pages long procedure, materials, all of it. And I emailed it to 200 different professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health. And I expected to sit back, waiting for all these positive emails to pour in. I'll be able to pick and choose my lab. It'll be great. I'll be hailed on time cover. Genius boy saves cancer. And then my goals hit a slight snag. I got 199 rejections. And I realized throughout this, professors aren't nearly as nice as their profile pictures make them look. And However, I eventually got one acceptance at Johns Hopkins University in the lab of Dr. Anurban Maitra. And I went in for this big interview, and it turned out to be an interrogation, really. I mean, he brought in 28 PhDs, and he's like, let's set the Guinness World Record for how many people we can cram into this, like, nine-by-nine nine room. I mean, great idea, right? And so we're, like, staying stuffed in there, and they're firing these questions at me. I guessed on quite a few of them. I always guess C, like I do on my SATs. And eventually, I got through it. Eventually, I got the lab space I needed. And as soon as I started, I realized how hopelessly idiotic I was in the lab. I mean, I screwed up every procedure. First day, let's culture some cancer cells. Pretty easy, right? No, I sneezed in them. Next day, I come in like I'm expecting, oh, they have an immune system, right? They're pretty hard to kill. No, they're like tentacles growing out of my flask. I'm like, oh, let's just hide that from my mentor. And I, like blew them up in the centrifuge. It was horrible. So eventually, after seven months of screwing every single imaginable lab procedure up, I finally ended with one small paper sensor that costs three cents, takes five minutes to run. It's 168 times faster over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, the coolest part is, <laughs> but also the coolest part is, is that it can detect the cancers in the earliest stage, when something has close to 100% chance of survival. But also, so far, 
is over 90% accuracy at detecting the cancer. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%. And it would do... And it would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But by switching out that, that antibody, you can detect an entirely different protein, ranging from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. The possibilities are endless. And throughout this journey, you know, I faced a lot of adversity. I mean, 199 professors told me no. Also, my parents told me no. I'm like, does anyone believe in this project besides me? At least it didn't tell me it'd be a paper mache volcano for my science fair project. However, one of the greatest adversities I faced throughout this entire journey were scientific paywalls. You see, 90% of all scientific articles are locked tightly behind these paywalls, meaning you have to cough up $35 just to read 11 sheets of paper. And because of this inhibitive cost, this made my research so much more difficult. And so, for example, I couldn't get articles I desperately needed access to. And so I decided, like any self-respecting teenager, to get a bit creative, and I pirated many articles. But when I couldn't do that, I had to email the authors, and oftentimes they didn't own the copyright to the article, the journal did, so they couldn't help me. And eventually I caved and paid $35 for those 11 sheets of paper, and then I realized this has nothing to do with my research whatsoever. And so I just wasted 35 bucks. Well, my parents did because they were the ones that bought the article. But this isn't just a problem for teenagers like me. I mean, like, we see all these big STEM initiatives. Like, we see we need more kids interested in science. But when the new Katy Perry single costs 99 cents and a seminal science paper costs $35, that's a bit of a mixed message, right? Because the world of science... Oh. <laughs> Because the world of science should be just as accessible as the world of pop culture and music. Because if we don't make it as accessible, then we'll just end up with a bunch of Kim Kardashians and Miley Cyrus is running around. <laughs> However, one of the scariest things I've seen with this entire movement is this quote. Harvard University recently released this, saying major periodical subscriptions especially to electronic journals published by historically key providers, cannot be sustained. Continuing these subscriptions on their current footing is financially untenable. Now, what does it say about the world of academic publishing, accessibility of knowledge, and the flow of information when Harvard University, the richest academic institution in the world, can't afford its articles? By putting in place these paywalls, we've instituted a very harsh class system. We have the knowledge elite, those corporate labs and big universities that can afford such articles. But also there's a hierarchy there. I mean, Yale and Harvard are going to have a lot more money than my local community college. And it's the same with countries. I mean, the US, it's shown that it has a lot more access to these articles than countries such as Ukraine, for example. I was just over there and they're like, we simply can't afford these articles. And then there's the knowledge middle class, people like you and me. We have like, access to the internet, we can read the abstracts, and we can read the 10% of articles that are open to the public. And then there's the knowledge underclass, those that have no access to the internet whatsoever. And these people, they can't get access to the scientific knowledge whatsoever. And so that means we're living in knowledge aristocracy, where essentially 0.008% of the world's population, those are the people that have the access to that scientific knowledge. That's like taking the population of Mexico City, pick 60 people off the streets. Those are the only people that can read these scientific journals. Everyone else has to be kept in the dark. And 80% of the world can't access this knowledge whatsoever. But imagine if we could live in a knowledge democracy, where from Mexico to Malaysia, from China to Cambodia, whether you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day, you'd have the same access to these scientific journals. Because science should not be a luxury, and knowledge should not be a commodity. It should be a basic human right.
the minds of the people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone, not the minds of the select few that can afford these articles. Science should be agnostic to how much money you have or where you work. Because a Pakistani girl should have just the same access to articles as a preeminent Nobel laureate at Harvard University. Not because it's sound economics, but because that's morally correct, and that's what we call equality. Because we have to dare to be the change that we seek in the world, and we have to have the audacity to change that. And we have to strive for this society, because if we don't, we further perpetuate a system that discriminates your access to articles based on how much money you have, your age, your gender, or where you work. And that's simply not right, and it's simply not effective. And if we don't make this change, we not only let down ourselves, we let down all future generations. We have the capacity to make this change currently. It's a matter of whether or not we want to change. And so our values as a society are not determined by nature or some nature's God. They're determined by the arbitrary force of our wills combined. And so do we want our legacy to be those of we marginalized those who couldn't afford these articles and we took away that knowledge? Or do we want to be the society that allowed everyone, no matter where they're from, to be able to access these, this knowledge? Because ideas don't discriminate who they come to. Great ideas can come to anyone, even a 15-year-old sitting in a biology class. So why should we discriminate their access to knowledge? So I believe that we can make such a change. And because think, if a 15-year-old who couldn't know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we could all do together. Thank you. So I think you have a question. <laughs> so Jack, we have two quick questions. I mean, everyone can see. I mean, everyone agrees that what, you, what you've done is so amazing, it should, it should be everywhere. I mean, how can we, what can we do, how can we rally for your technology to be in Mexico, to be in the rest of the world? When will this paper sensor be available for everyone? So with the current federal processes, it will take at least five to 10 years to get onto market. And so hopefully that's what we're going to be really helping to change because in the US, one of the main things that's holding us back is this one Supreme Court ruling that says institutions own a patient sample and not a doctor. And so that means per patient sample I want to test, I have to cough up $5,000 to test that sample for six drops of blood. So hopefully we can help change that so that life-saving technologies can get out of the market as soon as possible. So I know that you follow the news a lot and you're aware of um, the government shutdown and everything that went on. Of course, budgets are being cut everywhere, especially for science research and funding for that research. What do you think is the future of research in science, um, especially with the current situation? So I think that the future of scientific research really is going to have to shift from these institutions like uh, big universities to more kids like us. I mean, we're at the epitome of creativity and knowledge. I mean. We have so much creativity, we can dream up with wild ideas, but we have enough knowledge to make them possible. And so by helping include the younger generation, those two billion under 20, we can help make a scientific revolution. And by making these scientific articles available to everyone, we democratize the process of innovation such that all seven billion people can make a change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.